Uh, the next speaker is Bob Long. He's the Upland Game Bird Project Leader for the Maryland DNR Wildlife Heritage Service. Um, he's got a bachelor's degree from Virginia Tech and a master's degree from West Virginia University, both in wildlife management. Uh, Bob, you're on. Oh, there he is. Thanks, man. <laughs> I appreciate Mac putting this thing together. I'm going to be talking basically, you know, I could, I could talk for, you know, a whole weekend probably about the ins and outs and the details of habitat management for quail. And, um, you know, it's, it's not really the, the, the point I'm going to try to get across today. Uh, this is just a quick overview. I think it gave me about 45 minutes. Right. Um, just kind of an overview of what has happened to quail. And uh, Dr. Bell mentioned some of those um, uh, these nasty graphs, I hate that, and I've, I've got them in here, but I hate seeing those data. But, um, you know, what has happened to quail, you know, why it's happened, which there's still a lot of misinformation <coughs> and, um, and rumors, and everybody has their own idea, you know, try to clear some of that up, what's happened to them, and then some general things that you can do on your property to, um, to restore quail habitat and get quail back on there. Um, so with that, I'll... See if this is working for me. Try not to kick, a, kick the thing out of here. Um, quail, you know, they're northern bobwhite is what they are. Everybody knows them as quail. Um, and as you know, they're, they were a popular game bird for many years. Um, I'm sure we had more quail hunters than deer hunters uh, probably in the 60s. Uh, around the 70s, the pendulum swung a little bit. Um, they're the only native resident um, upland game bird. You know, turkeys. You know, a lot of people, bird, bird hunters in the room, probably don't consider them, you know, upland game birds. Uh, some folks do. Um, they thrived in the, uh, the, the landscape of the, the 40s through 60s, the heyday of quail. Um, you had brushy fence rows and uh, uh, weedy fields, and um, they weren't spraying Roundup on all the ditches. And, uh, you know, everything was great for quail, and they were everywhere. They were a real, you know, symbol of rural life, you know, and people hear the whistle, and uh, they, were, they were everywhere. Uh, unfortunately, you know, they've declined over 90% in the last 40 years, probably a, a little bit more than that. Um, and this is, you know, what I don't like to see and what we're trying to reverse, uh, but it, it's, it's a fact that uh, they've declined, you know, over 90% in Maryland. This graph isn't any different. It's very similar to any other state in the range of Bob Whites. Only a few places where quail are doing even moderately well, you know, Texas and, and some of those uh, more arid places where the habitat's a lot more, you know, static. It's just, you know, it's always out there, scrub, shrubland. Um, but in, in particularly in the east, the southeast, um, quail are, uh, are following this trend throughout their range. We've lost quail north of here. We're, we're basically at the far northern uh, fringe of of quail right now. There's a few in New Jersey, um, maybe a few in New York, Pennsylvania, um, but very, very isolated pockets. Here's the uh, breeding bird survey data, <clears throat> and we looked at it by route and just sort of did a rough extrapolation of, you know, where we have the most birds right now. Um, see the uh, uh, bulk of the, basically the darker the color, the more quail there are. <clears throat> um, and the uh, lower eastern shore is, is the hot spot right now from Dorchester County south. It's where you have more quail. And um, uh, southern Maryland still has some quail. Um, there's definitely wild birds there reproducing. Um, but north, of, north and west of Baltimore, uh, they're more or less non-existent, um, which, is, which is sad. Might be a few pockets here and there, but um, they... Uh, we lost most of those quail, according to our data, in the late 70s. In the uh, 78, 79, we had some severe winters. And most of those routes, which is where we, we get this data from, most of those routes went to zero after that real severe winter. Um, so uh, this is where we're at right now. This is what, you know, I hear on a daily basis. Everybody's got their own idea, and it's... Uh, um, and, and, you know, I could, I could list a lot more than this, but, you know, everything from, you know, diseases in chicken manure, um, you know, deer eating the habitat, there's too many foxes, too many hawks, too many snakes, um, herbicides, and, you know, you could go on and on. If some disease came through, wiped them all out. You know, 
there's been just study after study that you know has not you know, there's combinations of, of all those or some of those things going on but the absolute largest problem going on with quail and why they've disappeared throughout the entire range of the bird is a loss in fragmentation of habitat okay and um, the, you know a couple things in Maryland they're, they're big you know, changes in farming practices well, there's a, they, like uh, Dr. Bell said they are linked to farmland in Maryland and they have been for a lot of years um, prior to that they probably were were found in you know savanna pine savanna type forest that um, were burned on a regular basis had a lot of that kind of um, undergrowth and, and brush areas that they needed um, but in recent history they're linked to farms and uh, there's been a lot of changes in farming practices over the last 30 or 40 years development takes takes a toll on them and maturing forest this is something you don't hear a lot about when people talk about quail um, you hear from you know, Mark and Tom talking about woodcock and grouse. Um, but this is a big factor in Maryland. We have a lot of, of forests that have, used to be nice little brushy woodlots, and now they're, uh, you know, 80-year-old oak, oak woodlots, and there's no cover there. So let's talk about what quail habitat is. This is just uh, general, you know, sort of some mumbo-jumbo here, but early successional shrubland or grassland habitats with a diversity of grasses, forbs, shrubs, small trees, and food sources. Okay, so it's um, diversity. The key thing is early successional and diversity. You know, those, there's two take-home messages. You know, you, you want, you're talking about stuff that's not a mature forest, and, um, and there's a, a diversity. It's not monotypic. It just doesn't all look the same. And I'm going to go through a series of, I think the next eight or ten slides are just photos, um, pictures of places where there are quail, or there, at least there was when the uh, photo was taken. Because um, you could, you know, I could go through and say, well, you need 10% shrubs and, you know, 20% food plots and, and, you know, map it all out and show these schematics. But it really helps to just look at a place, kind of get a feel for it, you know. Um, I tell landowners that I, that I go out and I meet, you know, you just, it's sort of, a, you get a sense of what quail habitat looks like and uh, what good quail habitat looks like. And uh, there's not an exact prescription for it. And you just try to recreate that. Uh, this is a farm in Caroline County. <coughs> the, uh, there's a hedgerow planted on the, on the left, or actually it's just some, some pines and there were some shrubs planted. The field on the right was enrolled in the uh, CP33 program, which is a CRP program. Um, I'll talk a little bit about it. And uh, it was basically just a fallow field. Under that program, you can just delineate an area, let the weeds grow. Um, it's phenomenal. This one field was, I think maybe 10 acres, there was four broods of quail in that one field. It was all ragweed, um, which is great. Quail love ragweed. Um, so uh, it's, it was easy and quick to do. It just happened, you know, in one year they had four, four uh, broods there. This is another, um, where is this? This is Kent County. <clears throat> There's always a covey or two here. You can see the shrubs. And, and look for some, some common denominators through these slides. You can see some shrubs there in the, in the background. That's a tree planting, tree and shrub planting. And uh, in the front part of it, is a warm season grass field, native grass field that's been managed really well with disking and burning. I'll talk a little bit about that later. <clears throat> so it's uh, got a lot of diversity there and wildflowers, and it's a great spot for quail. Another farm, private farm in Caroline County that always has a few coveys. This is only about a 100 acre farm, but um, always holds some birds. This is a, uh, <clears throat> another just fallow field. It's just a, it's just a, it was a crop field, I think the year before this, this photo was taken. And uh, we flushed some birds right there and I took a picture of it and said, uh, you know, go put this in a, in a talk. Again, mostly ragweed in that field. Here's a uh, field border slash hedgerow uh, next to a bean field. You oftentimes find quail, especially early in the year, using these edges between um, soybean fields or, uh, or some other type of crop and the, uh, the edge, they, they like to use that edge habitat. 
Again, uh, similar type of situation. Uh, you've got <coughs> bean field and a, a CREP strip that is mainly broom sedge. Most of that was uh, uh, just naturally came up. It, it was planted in other species, but uh, broom sedge you know, came into that site really, really heavy and uh, it was a great place for quail. This is a property in Dorchester County, had a lot of quail. Are you familiar with Horn Point uh, Research Lab? Uh, anyway, Horn Point uh, outside of Cambridge, there, they had probably 15 or, or more coveys of quail for several years. Um, this was just a pasture that they got the property and they didn't do anything to it. They didn't mow it, they just let it grow up. Came in real heavy with uh, red cedar and some exotic shrubs, which aren't all that bad sometimes for quail, um, and a good, well-developed uh, ground cover of briars and various grasses and weeds. They had a lot of quail on that, on that relatively small property. Uh, since then, those cedars and the pines have overtaken everything and, and really shaded out that ground cover. There's, there's virtually no quail there now, uh, there's a few. Uh, you can do some good things in, in a more forested uh, setting. This is, uh, uh, you know, not an exceptionally old uh, loblolly. It was really just a peninsula of loblollies, and the landowner decided that, you know, he wanted to get some habitat benefit from that part of his farm, so he just went in with a, with a, uh, I think he did it with his tractor bucket, and just pushed over some of these trees and really opened it up, and... Uh, uh, he had, when I took this, this photo, there were several coveys of quail on this one little point. I think it was only five or six acres, and, and he had a few there, so it was nice. Tom might know this place. It's one of his, one of his rabbit hunting. I don't know anything about it. <laughs> um, this is uh, Chino Farms in Queen Anne's County, and we did a research project there, and I'm, I've got a few slides in going to talk about that research project. And this is a very large field of native warm season grass. There's uh, various species planted in here under the CRP program. There's, you know, big blue stem and Indian grass and little blue stem and uh, broom sedge and, you know, a variety of species that they're trying out, seeing what works best for a lot of wildlife, you know, not just quail, but for um, these songbirds that are, that are also in decline. Um, what they found is that this large field is just a, it's a mecca for quail nest, nesting quail. Um, they, they're raising broods there. Uh, I think it was two years ago they had 21 broods of quail counted out in this, this one large field. <coughs> um, we found some problems with, well, I'll get into it later, but you know, this is great for nesting and, and brood cover, and this is kind of what it looks like, but it's not the best uh, year-round cover. Um, I can't recall where this is, but uh, again, some of the, the common denominators, you have a good shrub, a patch of shrubs back there uh, next to some fallow fields. So a lot of the similar type of, of, uh, of thing that you're seeing there. <clears throat> this has been mentioned before, but grassland, shrubland, birds um, all use what we call early successional habitat. And all these species are in decline, and a lot of them, the, the grass, look very similar to the decline of quail. This is field sparrows which use somewhat similar habitat and uh, there's more, a lot more field sparrows than, than quail but um, you can see it mirrors it, the declines pretty closely. Hey Bob, yes. there was that huge spike for both in 88-1. Is anybody, was there any kind of event, a hurricane or something that might have caused that? Big spike 80, 81. The, da the downward spike? Yeah. That was the, the hard winters that we had. Okay. And that's where we lost a lot of quail in the, in the um, you know, central, northern, and western parts of the state. Yeah. Um, a lot of those routes went to zero. And then it was interesting because a lot of them came, you know, they rebounded within a yeah. few years in the rest of the state where you still had a, a remnant population and birds survived that winter. It seemed like they really came back strong there. And, um, the, you know, something that's kind of interesting is, you know, I mean, that, that went down pretty severely there, but the overall trend is, is the same. You know, that's not the reason that quail disappeared. Um, from the state as a whole. You know, they were on, on the decline earlier than that. 